Okay, it works. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when in November 2022, ChatGPT was released, it was almost like a wake-up call. It's not that AI hadn't been invented before, but before, nobody has taken it so much serious. Since November 22, it's almost uh, here in the middle of the society, and everybody thinks he or she should, can, will, has to use AI. We know that uh, artificial intelligence, and when I say artificial intelligence, I mean the whole scientific area, the rule-based, the data-based, the logic-based, which exists at least since 100 years, and it has been developed, in fact, in Vienna as part of the uh, Viennese circle. The whole AI will have unprecedented possibilities for our society in medicine, in education, in the society at large. But at the same time, we know there are a lot of challenges. Challenges due to fake news, fake pictures, due to manipulation. And when the US embassy approached us to discuss together the topic of fostering democracy in the age of AI, we immediately accepted. My name is Gerti Kappel. I am the Dean of the Faculty of Informatics at TU Wien. The Faculty of Informatics is the largest in Austria. You may say that's not difficult, but we are among the largest in, all, in, in Europe. And we are educating with our more than eight, 70 professors on all career levels. We are educating up to 5,000 students in computer science, business informatics, and related areas. Every year, something like 500 uh, students finish their studies at the bachelor and um, master level, and they go out into the whole world. Now, um, as faculty of informatics, we are existing since 20 years. Now, you might say, this is not very long. You can study computer science since more than 50 years at this university. But as an own organizational body, we have just reached adulthood. And the event today will be our kickoff for several events over the whole year where we try to live up to our slogan, dedicated to excellence, committed to society. Computer science, informatics has reached the society at all different levels. And it, we know it's our responsibility that we have to do research and that we have to do teaching, not only on a technical deep level, but also with all the responsibility we have in our hands with our tools. I'm very much honored to welcome our esteemed guests, first for the welcome addresses and then for the different lightning talks and discussions. I want to welcome for the uh, welcome address kind of the host of this uh, university, Vice Rector for Research, Innovation and Internationalization, Peter Ertl. Afterwards, the Ambassador and Director General of Cultural Affairs in the Federal Ministry of European and International Affairs, Mr. Thun Hohenstein will give his welcome address. And I can say most importantly, the amb ambassador is here. The ambassador of the United States, of the United States Embassy, Mrs. Kennedy, gives us really a, then a warm welcome also to this event. So I'm looking forward to your presentation. Your Excellencies, dear Madam Ambassador Kennedy, dear Mr. Ambassador Thun Hohenstein, 
respected colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor to welcome you at the festival of the TUV to discuss the impact of artificial intelligence on democracy. AI is used today in various sectors to provide personal recommendations, drive insight, help with discussion making, and provide basic assistance. There are many truly remarkable and transformative applications for AI in health, transportation, manufacturing, and farming. However, AI can also be used to create fake news and drive disinformation campaigns. Today, we are going to address some of the challenges currently facing Western democracies. The Vienna Manifesto of Digital Humanism, co-authored by our esteemed colleagues at the TUMIN, Professor Wertner, one of the pioneers is here with us tonight, welcome. The manifesto states and proclaims in one of its core principles that digital technologies should be designed to promote democracy and inclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe the statement to be key because it aligns us closer to our international partners and friends in North America. And by working together, we can ensure our democracies won't fail. Tonight, I'm also thankful for the opportunity to strengthen our bilateral initiative. Here, a special thanks to the Faculty of Informatics. This initiative aims to build people-to-people -people relations and encourage civic engagement, increases the dialogue about issues that are important to citizens of both countries, thus bringing Austria and the United States closer together on the basis of our shared democratic values. The Duin has been an internationally attractive place to study and conduct research for more than 200 years. Duin is therefore proud of its former graduates, including Christian Doppler, Victor Kaplan, Josef Loschmidt, Otto Wagner, Richard, Richard Sigmondi, our Nobel Prize in Chemistry, as well as our two current Nobel laureates in Physics, Professor Anton Zeilinger, Professor Ferenc Kraus, who are both closely associated with our institution. We are also very proud of our international student body. From the 26,000 students, currently more than 30% of non-Austrian citizenship and nationality. We are actively encouraging students and faculty members to engage in mobility activities, to gain international research experiences, participate in international collaborations and alliances. Among many, one such example is our collaboration with Caltech, which not only strengthens US-Austrian relationships, but it also provides our students with the opportunity to improve their language skills, expand their knowledge base, and as well as foster open-mindedness and tolerance. Thank you for being with us tonight. Wishing us all a stimulating and fruitful discussion. Thank you. Good evening. A warm welcome also from my side, both to, uh, to all of you who are here in this building, but also to uh, people online. And there are a lot of people online, I understand, too. Um, it is my firm belief that liberal democracy is the greatest achievement of human civilization. No better system has been invented so far. But we all know that democracy is under attack. In many parts of the world, we witness the closing of the democratic mind. And we see the emergence of dark democracies that have very little in common uh, with the principles and values of liberal democracy. What can be done? We all have to wake up and face the harsh reality. We know that democracy can never be taken for granted. But now we face the dilemma that artificial intelligence, the most powerful technology so far invented of our century, can more easily be used to undermine democracy than to strengthen it. Hence, the importance of fostering democracy in the age of AI cannot be overstated. We have to overcome the traps 
of complacency and nurture the social energy to defend democracy with a holistic mindset. Yes, we can unmask systems and patterns of AI that are detrimental to, to democracy. Yes, we can build creative AI models that promote both a broad democratic literacy, effective political participation, and constructive transparency in the business world. Yes, we can connect the dignity of humans with the dignity of nature and make that symbiosis the very foundation of democratic regeneration and progress in the age of AI. So yes, it is possible to turn AI into a key tool to build everlasting democracies. This is also one of the goals of a new regenerative digital humanism, but we have to work very hard. And we need more than top-down measures and intergovernmental cooperation. We urgently need to promote meaningful people-to-people -people relations and exchanges in order to generate utmost human commitment and agency for bright democracies. And we need to involve artistic intelligence, especially the youngest generation of artists in all fields, in order to imagine amazing, breathtaking democratic futures. And it's possible. So let us be bold and embark on a new vision and mission in the age of AI, holistic democracy care. Lots of thanks to you, Ambassador Kennedy, and your team for this wonderful cooperation. To you as Austria citizen, dialogue on global challenges is a key component of our strategic partnership with the United States. As underlined at the most recent strategic dialogue uh, in December, it is immensely important to connect especially younger generations on both sides of the Atlantic. And I've lived a long time on the other side of the Atlantic. I'm a huge fan of the US. Uh, through educational programs, people-to-people -people exchanges and dialogue initiatives and thereby deepen our relationship. Let me also thank Technical University Vienna for partnering up again with the foreign ministry. I'm not modest, people know me, as one of the inventors of digital humanism. Uh, I would like to pay tribute to the outstanding role and continuing commitment of TU Vienna in promoting digital humanism, a concept that is also embraced, as you know, by the Austrian Foreign Ministry with the Poistov Declaration and whatever happens afterwards, it will happen in the future. I'm also proud to mention and I'm coming to a close, the Art Prize for Digital Human Rights, organized by the Foreign Ministry. We will announce the winner very soon. A lot of people will be very happy in this room when hearing about the winner. A winner whose work has a strong focus on AI and is an impressive example of democracy care. I wish us all an enlightening and encouraging evening. Thank you very much. Dean Koppel, Vice Director Ertel, Ambassador Thun Hohenstein, Stein, excuse me, <clears throat> distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it is really an honor to welcome all of you to this inaugural event of our new People to People Initiative, U.S.-Austria Citizen Dialogue on Global Challenges. Special thanks to Teuvin for hosting us this evening to Ambassador Thun Hohenstein and his team, all of our friends at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for this important collaboration between the United States and Austria. 
As Ambassador Tun Hohenstein said, this series we launched today is the direct result of the ongoing strategic dialogue between our two governments, and it's evidence of our robust and vibrant bilateral relationship. The world is changing drastically, quickly, and without question, international cooperation is essential in the face of these complex dynamics. As my country's ambassador here for the last two years, I have been proud of the strong collaboration between the US and Austrian governments on our shared priorities, from supporting Ukraine against Russia's aggression and fostering democratic progress in the Balkans, to bolstering bilateral trade and investment to ensure our economic prosperity. And the list goes on and on. But as all of you understand, the US-Austria relationship goes much deeper than simply governments talking to governments, as important and as vital as that is. The strength of our relationship also lies in decades of shared history and culture, in our shared democratic values and belief in human rights and a law-based international order, in the understanding of the importance of cultural diversity and the exchange of experiences between artists, musicians, professors, and students, and in the shared responsibility we all bear in shaping a future that reflects those values. Indeed, the future of our nations depends as much on active collaboration between our citizens as it does on the relationship between our governments. Just as the complex developments of our world are too large for just one country to take on, they are too large for just governments to take on. The ideas, innovations, and passions of our vibrant civil society and active informed citizens are vital to addressing the world's challenges. In short, your role as engaged citizens is critical to preserving our shared values and indeed to securing the future of our democratic nations, our democratic institutions. In launching this dialogue series, we hope to provide a platform for American and Austrian experts, students, civil society leaders and active citizens to share experiences and expertise ask the tough questions, and build new transatlantic networks that could prepare both our societies for a better future. By fostering a deeper transatlantic understanding of the critical issues of the day, we bolster the very foundations of our democratic societies. To that end, this evening, we bring together US and Austrian experts to address one of the most pressing challenges of our time how we as democratic nations and engaged citizens embrace the opportunities and the challenges posed by AI. How does AI impact our people and our political systems? In our discussion tonight, we'll explore how we can embrace the positive aspects of technologies like AI, while also protecting and promoting our democratic values. As researchers and civil society leaders with strong backgrounds in technical issues, our two experts today, Merv Hickok and Peter Kniez, are uniquely placed to, prov to provide insights into these questions. We're grateful for their participation and are optimistic that tonight's dialogue will lead to new Austrian-American civil society collaboration on this important topic. But this is just a beginning. We also hope to pave the way for future Austrian and American people-to-people -people discussions on other important issues of the day, such as disinformation. Thank you all for joining this evening. I'm very much looking forward to, I know what will be a robust and informative discussion, and I am really delighted to be here and be a part of it. Thank you.
you know, the topic, democracy, fostering democracy in the age of AI, couldn't be placed better at the beginning of the year 2024. Both USA, Austria, the U European Union, we are all waiting for the elections, which are kind of anti -porters. And we know elections are really at the center, at the heart of a democratic system, of a law-based system. And we also know how difficult it is to ensure that everything goes based on uh, the, the rights and the laws we have given to our society. Therefore, it is very much important that all people scientists, researchers, universities, take up this topic and really go out and speak up for the values and for the positive uh, impact of technology. We have to teach our students, but we have to teach our pupils. We have to go into the schools and explain why technology can be used for the public good, for the societal good, and how we can protect against the misuse. I'm very delighted that we have uh, as moderator, Christiane Wendehorst. Christiane Wendehorst is professor for um, innovation and digitalization in law at the University of Vienna. She is in fact co-directing the Institute. She is the scientific director of the European Law Institute and she is member of the American Law Institute. So we couldn't have found a better person having both the transatlantic uh, genome in her kind in her body and having really the spirit and the cognitive values for moderating such an event. Christiane, it's your floor. Ambassador Kennedy, Ambassador Thun Hohenstein, Vice Rector Ertel, Dean Kappel, um, distinguished speakers and audience. It's a great pleasure and privilege for me to be standing here and moderating this part of the session. Um, democratic values, our democracies are um, under attack. This was um, how you introduced your um, welcome address, and um, I couldn't agree more, I have to say. Um, we can't take anything for granted anymore. I mean, arguably, we've never been able to take anything for granted. So this is also true, but we can't take it for granted in particular in today's times and in the face of um, digitization and advanced AI. And this, in fact, is surprising because originally uh, digitization came with a promise. I mean, when in history has information been freely available for everybody instantaneously on the internet? When in history have we been able to communicate with everybody around the globe in real time at, um, well, seemingly no cost? Um, when in history has every individual been able to make themselves heard as they are able to do so today. And at first sight, you might say, well, this is something that is a prerequisite, an ideal breeding ground for democracy and democratic participation. But the reality seems to be different. We're seeing um, people storming Capitol Hill. We're seeing um, the Cambridge Analytica scandal. We're seeing problems all around. So everybody's talking about why and how AI and digital technologies may pose a threat to our democracies. And indeed, um, it, it's not for me to, to give a lecture on that here, because we have marvelous speakers, just maybe to mention some of the real challenges we are seeing, or we are really um, um, also concerned about, because we are facing elections. We are facing elections in the US. We are facing elections in Europe. We are facing elections in Austria, as uh, Dean Kappel just mentioned. So what are the 
some of the challenges we see. Well, it's disinformation and fake news, of course, at an unprecedented scale. It's the generation of traffic by bots and trolls that simulate majority opinion. It's micro-targeting of users, often exploiting vulnerabilities um, of those users. It's algorithmic selection of content that may have the effect of creating what we have come to call filter bubbles and echo chambers. It's amplification of content, increasing the reach and apparent relevance of content. And the consequence of all this is that um, people don't trust information anymore or maybe they trust the wrong information and what i believe is the worst phenomenon is that people are leaving living in in in, in kind of separate worlds nobody knows what the other is reading on their smartphone and all this in all this ai plays a major role and we need to look at it more closely. And we have two marvelous speakers uh, tonight um, who are really, really uh, the best people to give maybe tentative answers. We, well, we, we, when, when we met before this event, we said we're going to solve all the problems tonight. I don't know whether we will succeed in doing so. Ambassador, you, you said that. Um, but anyway, we will try to give some tentative uh, answers. It's my great privilege to start with Mervy Hickok. Merve is the president and senior research director of the Center for AI and Digital Policy and the founder of AI Ethicist Org. Um, her work intersects both AI ethics and AI policy and governance. Um, she is a data ethics lecturer at University of Michigan School of Information. And um, among all the functions she has, so I could take the rest of the evening in, in listing all her functions, I will just mention a few. She's advisor at the Civic Data Library of Context, member at uh, IEEE working groups on AI standard setting and open community for ethics and autonomous and intelligent systems. And maybe just one more detail before I hand over to you. She has been recognized by several organizations and most recently, as one of the 100 brilliant or most brilliant women in AI ethics 2021, probably one of the most brilliant 10 or maybe five uh, women. Um, Merve, we, we are really privileged to have you here tonight and just the, the floor is yours. We are very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for spending your evenings with us. Um, Ambassador Kennedy, Ambassador uh, Tun Holstein, thank you so much for having me. It is an absolute honor to be here tonight. Um, it has been a minute. It has been like 29 years since I've been to Vienna. The city has changed. Uh, so I really appreciate being here tonight, contributing to the U.S.-Austria Citizen Dialogue because it is one of the reasons uh, this dialogue and public engagement has been one of the reasons that we founded our center in the first place. I also would like to thank TUEN for not only hosting this event, but also for their contributions to this dialogue. So before I go deep into my subject, uh, I would like to take have a sincere congratulations to some of the scholars, some of the friends in TUEN, for their recent book, Digital Humanism, the new textbook, uh, where many friends and scholars that I admire have written chapters, so I strongly suggest and recommend that book. I also would like to remind this group, if you're not aware uh, of the Vienna Manifesto that has been mentioned a few minutes ago, but it was in 2019 here where it started after a workshop uh, calling on digital humanism and calling on importance of human rights and the power of humans, the control of humans over their future and society, uh, the manifesto of us created. So again, if you have not seen it yet, I would strongly recommend it. With that call at the back of our minds, um, tonight I would like to focus especially on AI technology and what that means for our democracy, democratic values, and human rights. 
these are all the also the values, democratic values and human rights uh, are also the North Stars for my center, Center for AI and Digital Policy. We are an independent nonprofit, uh, research and education nonprofit based in DC, but working globally, advising national governments, international organizations, and supranational organizations such as EU, Council of Europe, OECD, UNESCO, United Nations, and along uh, the list of or other organizations. We are strong advocates for public participation. And one of our main activities is educating and training future AI policy leaders. Um, over the years, we have trained many technologists, lawyers, academics, civil society leaders in this. In fact, our new semester started yesterday with 350 people, participants from 82 countries. So when we talk about citizen dialogue, public engagement, we walk the talk and I say hi to uh, some of our participants that I know uh, are watching tonight. Um, with the rise of digital technologies, our modes of interaction, communication, and even governance have rapidly shifted. We have seen significant transformations and maybe less just the tip of the iceberg for that transformation as well. Among the many ad advancements, social media and AI have started changing our roles and will continue to change the world. These socio-technical systems impact how we access information, how we see which kind of news, which kind of information, which kind of worldview that we see, how we make decisions, uh, and what kind of actions and the determinations are made on our lives, how we access resources, how we use, how, are, how they are used in hiring, education, insurance, government benefits, credit, law enforcement, immigration, the list goes on. There is not a single domain today that AI is not used. Few technologies have permeated our lives so quickly and raised so many questions at the same time. So many questions about human dignity, human agency, and justice in general. We believe that AI will positively change our lives and will bring significant benefits it will provide us with the opportunity and possibilities to um, process information on at unprecedented scale. It presents invaluable insights and it is an asset navigating the complex digital sphere and complexities of today's interconnected environment. It allows us to simulate research ideas uh, and products without touching natural resources. You can do simulations, amazing simulations, without impacting the environment. It creates opportunities for all of us to express ourselves, participate in what matters to us the most. We also believe the irresponsible design and use of AI can lead to unintentional deepening of existing inequalities, whether in terms of gender, race, ability, just to name a few. We have seen time and time again that AI systems can amplify gender and racial or ability biases, like I mentioned, results in biased outcomes for women in employment, in financial loans, in insurance or health contexts. Some AI products work less or less accurately for women and more, uh, less, even less accurately for women of color. An estimated 1.3 billion in the world experience significant disability. This represents 16% of world population, one in six of us. Yet many AI systems do not represent this um, diversity of abilities or the ways people with disabilities engage with these systems for closing the enjoyment of their rights, access to products or services. The algorithms, driving, the algorithms driving AI are only as unbiased as their data or as biased as their data. The inadvertent perpetuation of biases poses serious challenges to equitable deployments of these technologies. AI can also be intentionally used for malicious purposes. However, 
it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to stay this way. AI reflects what we prioritize and what we want to do with it. In other words, uh, as the talks before me mentioned, AI can be a good force to foster democracy and human rights, or it can undermine it. In the age of AI, fostering democracy is not a preference. It is an imperative. And I'll say this again and again and again. Democracy, with its emphasis on inclusive decision-making, human rights protections, provides a crucial framework for us, uh, not only to integrate AI into our societies, but for the benefits. By aligning the development of AI systems with democratic values and human rights, we can benefit and also keep the, uh, the organizations, public and private organizations, accountable for their uh, for their decisions, for their practices. We can empower the individuals. This alignment becomes paramount when we are talking about navigating the transformative power of AI. I want to ask for a second. We talk about democracy. We talk about democratic values. But what is it that actually comes to your mind when I say democratic values? Have you ever thought of like what actually what kind of values that actually make our democracy? Respect for human rights and human dignity, access to accurate information, meaningful public engagement, free elections, maybe respect for minority rights over majority, free pluralistic mass media, independent oversight, or maybe separation of powers, all of the above and more. So democracy is not one thing. The democratic values that make up our democracy are what we make of them, how we protect them, and how we reflect them in, uh, in the use of AI. Citizen participation in democracy and accountability is paramount. As mentioned, 2024 is a major year for elections. In fact, with more than 60 countries experiencing elections or plan to have elections this year, it is the highest number of elect elections in the history. We will not have this kind of elections until number of elections until 2048. So take a moment this year to, to understand where we are in, in history and where we are coming in. in uh, I would like to see not a perfect storm, but an uh, ideal uh, results at the end of this year with AI. A few days ago, Taiwan held its elections and in what was a test for the country's ties to China or its position against China, whatever you look at it, seven of the world's 10 most populous countries are going to have ex elections this year. Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Mexico, United States, Pakistan, Russia are going to the ballot. Austrian citizens, I know some of you will be going to the ballots later this year in fall. So how does AI come to this? You know, we have some ideas uh, uh, mentioned uh, previously, but I would like to take us back to data first. Uh, everything starts with data. First, we have mass and indiscriminate collection of data about our preferences, our online engagements, our behavior and our choices. This very, very granular uh, data is held not only by the most powerful technology companies, but they're also sold. I can go out and buy this data on your preferences, on your choices. It can be, this data can be repurposed not only by other companies, by governments, but also by malicious actors. Second, we have social media and a number of communication platforms today uh, which have lowered the cost of information diffusion and distribution. The recommender algorithms on these platforms, social media platforms, are known to create echo chambers, the filter bubbles, for users resulting in further polarization and radicalization. AI can amplify these concerns, and it can also be used, the data and this uh, diffusion can also be used to 
exploits and manipulates public opinion. This issue is compounded by the fact that many of these platforms where we are standing today have either reduced the number of trust, safety, disinformation, misinformation teams in these organizations. So you might have seen a number of layoffs, layoffs in, in major companies. But some of them, like X, formerly known as Twitter, have actually limited the amount of information, the data that researchers and independent uh, academics and independent researchers can access. So independently, we cannot access this data as we used to, or they're actually selling the data, which makes it cost prohibitive to get this data and do independent accountability and, and research. So we're at a point where commercial commercialization and profits are also being prioritized over research oversight and societal impact. Now comes generative AI, a relatively new uh, feature in our lives, a very exciting and emerging technology. And some of you might have uh, played with it. Uh, I know some of my friends, my colleagues, grandparents play with it. Um, majority of the mainstream use is for fun for creative purposes to play around, et cetera, or for small business, like professional tasks. However, many of the users today also do not know the limitations of these systems or the actual technical uh, capabilities and limitations of these systems. Generative AI allows you to create content such as text, audio, video, even software code without any technical skills. You can just tell the system what you want, type in, or even talk to the system, tell it what you want, and it will create. You don't need any technical skills anymore. The natural language has replaced some of those technical skills required previously. So now we have the thresholds to create this content. The technical skills and the cost to create this content has come down as well, right? This capabilities means, again, that the cost and the threshold has come down for malicious actors as well. So imagine this with the elections looming ahead, imagine the scenario or the situation where you have access to significant amounts of granular personal data. You have, you can tailor, I'm oh, sorry, you can create tailored synthetic contents, deepfakes or other content, you name it. And then you have this communication platforms and social media platforms, which makes it almost free to diffuse this again in a very targeted, um, in a very targeted way. And then you can use these synthetic contents uh, to solve discord, distrust, and, and confusion. And I'll come back to trust, the importance of trust at the end, but like I mentioned, you're coming to this like perfect trifecta of data, algorithmic diffusion of inform information or content and synthetic content coming head to head ahead of elections. This is not to say at all the question, you know, this is um, not to say that we lost the game and we shouldn't engage as citizens. Totally the opposite. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But if you have not thought about these issues up until today, or if you were uh, you know, thinking about it just at the back of your mind, I really want call to call you to action tonight um, to foster democracy, to protect not only your rights, but the rights of your loved ones, your children, your parents, your communities, to fight against the erosion of trust. Just take a second to think, what happens when you do not trust what you see or what you read? If I'm not trusting what I see, if I'm not in the room, it means that if I'm not in the room actually experiencing something, I am not going to trust it. And you can play that information, you can play that erosion of trust to the worst angels of our communities to create more polarization and radicalization. Or we can 
go for the better angels of our societies and use it to foster democracy and human rights. Elections represent the very essence of democracy, the opportunity for citizens to express their political preferences, elect who they're going to, who should represent them. So we don't have the luxury to dis disengage from this democratic process. We cannot say, I'm not going to vote because I don't trust. I'm not going to uh, go to the polls because I don't trust the results. AI has already rigged the game. It is imperative, it is imperative to invest in public literacy in AI and digital literacy at large to safeguard not only our rights, our public engagements, but for democracy. And we need governments to invest in this, as well as the education institutions, understanding the benefits, the possibilities, but also the limitations of these technologies. Always advocating, at least in our case, always advocating for better democratic governance and fostering of human rights. As we consider AI's role, we must acknowledge its impact on journalism as well. In an age where information is created and disseminated at lightning speed, AI stands as an invaluable tool in sorting out the truth, the wealth of information, and identifying falsehoods. And AI can actually help us to detect that, automate, it, automate some of the fact-checking, counter the spread of disinformation and misinformation, and see what kind of networks this information is, is spreading through. In that sense, we also need to demand more from our journalistic platforms. Demand more fact-checked news, demand news that center human rights and democracy, but also help these journalistic medium, uh, mediums and journalism, journalistic organizations uh, help with malicious actors as well, whether it's through policy, regulation, or engagement. We need businesses deploying or developing and deploying AI to center the interest of their customers and stakeholders. Because at the end of the day, losing trust doesn't only mean, doesn't only impact democracy. Losing trust means we're going to have less adoption of AI. If I don't trust AI system is going to have an outcome that is beneficial, that is fair, that is less, you know, not discriminative, we are not going to adopt this technology. We're not going to invest it. We're not going to be selling it. So there is a future long-term implication of trust on it as well. And we need also the policymakers and governments to address this challenge straight ahead. And we need the governments to act with urgency and establish guardrails for AI systems and obligations for AI developers. Looking for liability and accountability when AI systems infringe upon human rights and, and safety. I would say regulations, and I can say that more clearly in, in Europe, regulation provides clarity for innovation and investments. I cannot tell you the number of AI developers, small and medium-sized organizations that I talk to are waiting for that clarity to be able to develop products. Regulation sets the minimum requirements to mitigate bias, ensure safety and security. Regulation also establishes obligations for AI developers so citizens do not become experiments. Understanding the expectation and boundaries of what can be done. The framework can also help the designers and developers to be more deliberative, more considerate and inclusive in their designs. And I'll call, call upon something that's happening or have been happening in AI policy for a while now, that we have an agreement between industry, the governments, the civil society and academia on the need and urgency of regulation and for some AI systems, prohibitions. So EU has led some of this work on prohibitions saying some AI systems like predictive policing, like biometric categorization, social scoring are so fundamentally in conflict with human rights and democracy that they do not have a place in Europe. 
you cannot sell this product, you cannot use this product in Europe. We have seen similar calls from UNESCO, from United Nations, on what those prohibitions should be. So in a democratic society that pro pro prioritizes democratic values and human rights, we should also feel comfortable about calling some red lines bright red lines on prohibi prohibitions on AI systems. I would like to um, you know, touch upon fostering cooperation for uh, AI policy and citizen dialogue and kind of come to, to my closing remarks. I mentioned public engagement and citizen engagement was um, really, really important for us, but so is creating this oversight and accountability for uh, governments as well. So either at the entrance or outside, you'll see this card and what it takes you down up to is a called our flagship report called AI and Democratic Values Index. And in a, in a couple of months, we're going to publish the fourth annual edition. So what we try to do is analyze 75 countries against their national AI policies, against their AI regulations, commitments, versus their practices. And it has been a foundational resource for policymakers and, and researchers around the world. And when we assessed Austria, uh, you will see it when you read the report, hopefully, that we commended Austria for the steps it has taken for public engagement, for citizen engagement in its national AI strategy. Uh, and part, you know, prioritizing that engagement ahead. And tonight, I think, is another sh show of that. We have a voice. We all have a voice. You do not need technical skills to be able to talk about AI's impact on your lives. We have everyone's voice at the table. And increasingly, the space and the resources available to civil society and academia and citizens at large are shrinking. So as a final call to action, I would say invest in civil society and academia. Make it easy for citizens to engage in these policy conversations with their local or national governments and make those opportunities meaningful as in don't listen to them, but actually hear them and what they want from their policy, from the policy. And I would call on institutional collaboration between the US and Austria if possible. Tonight is a perfect example of that, but hopefully in the future we see professional and academic exchange programs on AI and democracy. Uh, maybe pub for further public educational activities or even virtual citizens for forums. I will leave you with, again, coming back to the trust, the very foundation of our society now lies on the cusp of, of physical and digital worlds. And remember 2024, remember where we're heading and remember that you all have a voice and thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you so much, Merve, for that call to action and 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 this uh, truly thought provoking talk. Um, I, I immediately wrote down your sentence. You know, fostering democracy is not a preference; it's an imperative. But also your optimistic view of it does not have to be this way. And indeed, you know, this is also what Ambassador Kennedy said uh, initially. It's our shared responsibility of shaping a future that reflects the democratic values we all uh, believe in. Um, thank you so much again. It's now my, my privilege to, to introduce our second speaker, uh, Peter Knees. Um, Peter is a uh, holder of the UNESCO Chair on Digital Humanism, which makes him the ideal person to uh, be standing here. Um, Peter is Associate Professor of Data Science at this university. Uh, he's Curriculum Coordinator of the Bachelor of Informatics um, with a special 
focus on, on artificial intelligence and machine learning. He's a, a substitute member of the faculty council and he's extremely active, and I would like to stress this, in the digital humanism uh, movement, if I can, may, may, may say so. So Peter is really one of um, the, 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 the pillars of uh, this uh, digital humanism, um, which has been mentioned on various um, occasions tonight. Um, and so um, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing what Peter has to say on the topic. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christiane, for the introduction, and thank you, Merva, for this wonderful talk. I mean, I agree with what you said. Um, there's not always a need to to disagree on these things. I think a dialogue that where people disagree can can be quite nice, actually. Um, so let's start this um, officially. Um, Ambassador Kennedy, Ambassador Thun Hohenstein, Vice Rector Ertel Dean Kauper, dear fellow citizens. Um, since it's a citizen's dialogue, I have to inform you, I named or I, I, I gave this talk a title or I was asked for a title and I call it Digital Humanism as Response to the Triple Use of AI. I have to tell you that otherwise the things I'm going to say don't make sense. If you don't know that the title of this talk is Digital Humanism as Response to the Triple Use of AI, then you're going to be very, you're going to be wondering what, what this is about. Because I'm going to start with the practice um, that we have here as at TOV and as researchers. Um, when we hear a TOV go through the process of, of applying for research funding and registering our project in the systems of TOV, we have to check a box in the system indicating whether the research, quote on, has possible dual use and or aspects of misuse, end of quote. Um, and of course, no one likes to, or, or actually, of course, everyone likes to click no on this one because we don't consider research to be targeted at the military use next to the civil use. So the dual use is mil civil and military. Now, from the title of my talk, you can see that actually, you know, triple use, that actually I'm not going to talk about dual use, but I want to talk about the triple use of technology and specifically artificial intelligence. Um, and probably this should be called trial use, I think, like grammatically correct. That didn't resonate so well, so apologies to the native speakers in the room, sorry for that. Um, I'm gonna go with triple use. So what is the third use besides the dichotomy of military and civil purpose? I suggest to refer to this as the uncivil use of AI. And this actually refers to what is probably meant by misuse in our project system. And um, I would argue this is unfortunately the one on the rise and or at least the one that is currently debated in public the most. And uh, also just to clarify, I'm not going to say that or rule out that military military use is not uncivil, nor do I want to say that uncivil use might not be the result of military use, actually. Um, but I see this point at best hinted at in the debate currently, and I think in this case it would deserve a broader audience, but then we should have this discussion really specifically on information wars and these kind of things. I'm not going to go into this in detail. But there are some obvious examples of uncivil use when we discuss the impact of AI on our democracies. And we've heard these examples before, um, and I just want to reiterate them and, and bring them into perspective uh, for, my, for, my, um, for my statement here. Um, generative AI tools offer unprecedented capabilities and automation potentials. So of course, the thing that we think about first, what we can do with it, is we could genera generate false and misleading content in high volumes, potentially even personalized, increasing the division and weakening solidar solidarity. Uh, we can generate better and more believable spam emails, phishing emails, or any other fraudulent content and use the machine to take advantage of others. We know about the power of images, so to tell a false story more convincingly, we can create a picture that proves our claim or create the illustration that triggers our stereotypes. We combine the made-up claims with the image of an adversary and produce false evidence as a video with a deep-faked voice clone to prove the accusation. Um, now, that seems almost unavoidable to us when we see examples of the capabilities of AI, and naturally, we are concerned. We see what can be done. We see what it can uh, could be abused for, um, and also is. Um, so this is obviously threatening in the context of politics and particularly in the context of elections, as, as we've heard. 
Um, there have been examples already, and they are win-win for everybody interested in hijacking and, and poisoning the public discourse. Um, one possibility is that people fall for the false information. Um, so they believe the made up content. Another um, possibility is that even if it is badly executed, it still shifts attention towards the parties or the candidates and their audacious attempts. And basically that gives them another way of jumping onto the AI hype and still generating um, you know, attention that way. So basically you win either way, whether it's well done or not, if you just use AI currently in, in politics. Um, on the other hand, and this might be a bubble problem, but I don't really think so. In my impression, whoever you talk to about AI will tell you something like the stories that I mentioned before, or like this, these stories. People seem to be very aware that online content is not trustworthy anymore. Um, misinformation might be a threat, but I agree, erosion of trust is more realistic, actually. Um, a general erosion of trust. Um, and the distrust that develops is unfortunately not necessarily critical or reflective. Um, otherwise it could actually be useful, but that's not happening. So it really just leads to a general um, development of distrust. Um, last week I read a small news story, maybe you've read it too, about new problems that developers of open source projects are facing. So I'm gonna be a bit more technical on this thing now, since we're at the TU, I'm giving you an example from, from this year. So this is an issue for open source projects. When developing open source software, um, people, so what happens there, people can look into the code, contribute parts, um, identify issues. It's a collaborative effort. Um, so this is, this is quite, uh, quite helpful. And it's particularly important to identify security threats. And if that happens, somebody identifies something like that. In such a case, a report is issued to point out the problem. Now, apparently, and I'm not sure this was done with good or bad intentions in the first place, these bug reports are now submitted by AI as well. Large language models as used in AI tools like ChatGPT can not only converse convincingly in natural language, but also generate program code. Moreover, they will generate explanations for what the code does or point out flaws if asked. Now, the idea is very tempting to automatically review open source projects for bugs and security threats that way. But also here we have the issue of possible so-called hallucinations. That is the generation of non-factual statements. And in the example, the claimed issue that bug report that was submitted was simply not real. However, the project developer tried repeatedly to understand the issue that was claimed. Um, the AI generated responses were eloquent and insisting, and it took the developer some iterations to understand he was talking to an AI and that the report made no sense at all. And maybe this is one episode that is still funny and undoubtedly much more time is still spent by developers fighting about code with other human developers than with machines, but it shows that the collaborative systems that we have built in the online world might need recalibration. Automatic code checks with useful explanations would be great for writing better software, and it is worth looking into issues possibly overlooked by humans, but if overdone or unsolicited, humans might lack the resources to deal with this. So this might turn into something useful as well as be used in an uncivil manner, leading to denial of service attacks, not only to machines, but also to humans. So a denial of service attack is actually when you um, send too many requests to a system so that it effectively, you stop it from operating. So that happens with servers when you want to take them down, for instance, but you can also do this to machines apparently. So this is a threat to open systems, both system in the sense of technical system, but also maybe a society. But if we blame the concept of openness for the attacks made on it, we actually lose more than we save. Now, this is also not new and does not necessarily depend on AI or the quality of the output an AI can generate. In media consumption, this has been a problem long before. It is ultimately a matter of volume. We are overwhelmed by content and recommender systems amplify this phenomenon rather than acting as the information filters they are supposed to be to help us lessen this burden. And I say this very openly and critical. I work on recommender systems and they could do a much better job. And actually we could do a much better job in making better recommender systems, but that's just a side remark. Um, the quality of the produced content is not even so relevant. It's the sheer amount that can bury the information. When it comes to information, we are already victims of denial of service attacks. We just might stop paying attention 
in the worst case, we can't fulfill our dem democratic roles and duties to the best of our own interest because we are overwhelmed and look for the easy way out. Politically, politically speaking, that denial of service attack has been termed flood the zone with shit by Steve Bannon. Um, the Austrian counterpart of strategically necessary nonsense just sounds less offensive, but it's nonetheless revealing its origins in the same political camp, basically. Um, so for this political strategy, a broken media system like social media seems perfect, not to mention if important social media is bought and restructured with the goal of emphasizing the new owner's own political views and preferences. So while AI can be instrumental in implementing such a political agenda via online media, the problem this poses on democracy is not stemming foremost from the advances in AI. AI might amplify it and serve as a catalyst, but the brand AI, whatever it actually refers to, serves very well as a new smokescreen to avoid the old discussions on media ownership media concentration and profit interests. As in all areas, we see the term AI being exploited. And in this case, we can talk about AI, but I think we should primarily talk about the role that media plays for our democracy or should play or should not play. After all, media is called the fourth estate or fourth power and has a vital role in democracy. Media pluralism is essential and guarantees a diversity of opinions being voiced. But if this is purely a private matter, the topic agenda and the tone is set by those who own the media. And apparently this does not lead to diversity a lot. Should that be regulated? It's difficult. Um, I'm just gonna give my personal take here um, and ask the question, are we actually having the media landscape um, and the public sphere that we want as a society? Are we content with what this looks like? I don't wanna point any fingers, but let's take the example of Fox News in the US. Is it now just accepted that this is, that this is what media looks like? Um, if you think of a future of progress and a stable democracy, would that be on television? Is that your vision? Is that your utopia, what the future will look like? Um, you know, the argument is if people are watching, that must be the ultimate proof that this is needed. But if that is the case, I'm also asking the question, what is the constructive takeaway from this? And how do we go from there? And how do we improve based on this, on this learning? Of course, I want to make another point, and that is the need of trustworthy media in the form of impartial, publicly funded media, that is, public service media. Despite decreasing trust in such institutions, or decreased trust in such institutions, I think we need this central pillar in the media landscape. Media is not just a question to leave to the market. Democracy is not just a question to leave to the market. I think public service media needs to be extended even, and it should not be the private sector that dictates or negotiates what the public is allowed to have in their own media. There is an initiative strongly co-driven by Austrian journalists from the ORF that also makes a strong point for a public service internet. And they have released a manifesto I'd like to quote the beginning of. It's not the last manifesto I'm going to quote in the, in the course of this talk. Um, there's gonna be another one that was mentioned already. Um, the Public Service Media and Public Service Internet Manifesto, principle one, democracy and digital democracy require public service media. We call for the safeguarding of the existence of public service media. Principle two, a democracy enhancing internet requires public service media becoming public service internet platforms that help to advance opportunities and equality in the society. We call for the creation of the legal, economic and organizational foundations of such platforms. Principle three, Public service media content is distinctive from commercial media and data companies. It addresses citizens, not consumers. And since it's a citizen um, assembly here, I think that means us. Um, and I think we should even go further. I think internet regulation should adopt many of the ideals and goals of public service media. And with a public service media house, and now this is for the Austrians in the room, um, with a public service media house, it should also be no problem to host and publish a daily printed newspaper as Austria was able to do for over 300 years before deciding that another website is strongly needed instead. Um, so yes, if you ask me what to do with AI and democracy and media, my answer is bring back a printed newspaper with high journalistic standards that not enough people have read. That's my solution to the problem. Uh, You gotta fight incivility with civility and reason. Um, and since I'm already handing out free advices, I have one for the US as well. Um, 
I think in the US it would be important to repeal or reform section 230, which brings us right back to the responsibility of internet platforms. They have responsibility and they know it. And we know that they know all too well, thanks to Francis Harbin. They should be liable as well. So apparently I've already transitioned to talking about ways to change the broken system. And I have not once mentioned digital humanism so far. Well, I mentioned the title, right? Um, which is according to the title of the talk, a response to the triple use of AI. What do we understand as digital humanism? I refer to the Vienna Manifesto. Digital humanism describes, analyzes, and most importantly, influences the complex interplay of technology and humankind for a better society and life, fully respecting universal human rights. I add that this also includes respect for and bettering of community, society, and the environment. Digital humanism has many common goals with like-minded initiatives dealing with human-centered technology and AI development, such as regulation, the establishment of rules and laws to ensure accurate, fair, accountable, and transparent software programs and algorithms. But beyond that, it puts democracy at its core. I quote again the manifesto, digital technologies should be designed to promote democracy and referred this before in the, in the beginning, right? Should be designed to promote democracy and inclusion. This will require special efforts to overcome current inequalities and to use the emancipatory potential of digital technologies to make our societies more inclusive. Privacy and freedom of speech are essential values for democracy and should be at the center of our activities. And we are aware that this requires action Therefore, we are convinced, for instance, that regulators need to intervene with tech monopolies. But also on the academic side, we need to think across disciplines and engage in joint efforts and define our research agendas to adhere to humanistic ideals and values needed in today's technology. Again, I'm quoting the manifesto, we must shape technologies in accordance with human values and needs instead of allowing technologies to shape humans. And I have already mentioned the values of privacy, freedom of speech, fairness, diversity, inclusivity, and I'd like to briefly mention a few of the ongoing projects at Theorene Informatics that embody these. Brace yourself, you're going to be called part of some of you in the room. Um, so my colleague and co-UNESCO chair, Julia Neidhardt, heads the Christian Doppler Lab for recommender systems to address questions of diversity and fairness in, in different domains. Martina Lindorf looks at, into matters of applied security and uh, privacy, for instance, in mobile application. She has also written an excellent chapter in the latest textbook that was mentioned before. So I, I advise you to, to read that. But in case you stumble upon that, maybe it will be mentioned in the course of the of the evening. Um, in the TACO project, Alan Hanbury is um, looking into automated content moderation and user agency therein. Um, I don't think he's in the room, but Martin Kamper leads a project on AI in care work Emanuel Salinger, I've seen before, runs a project in which he uses knowledge graphs to increase the recycling rate of organic waste. Um, Jan Marley is researching how participatory design decision processes, for instance, in cities, can be developed to not only cater to the needs and preferences of the majority, but of all demographic groups. Katha Spiel recently received an ERC starting grant for the research on how people with disabilities experience access to technology. Um, as advice is researching embodied AI and human robot interaction, different contexts. I've seen that uh, Florian Michaelis is here, he's doing human centric AI. I've seen, I've seen this read, um, and I see Clemens and other people that are working in, in machine learning with applications that are actually useful for society. Um, and probably I've forgot a lot of others here, but there's really a wealth of projects that care about humans primarily. And I do need to mention the UNESCO Chair on Digital Humanism, since I was announced as this, which I hold together with Julia, where we aim to bring these discussions and awareness into education, not only here at TU, but also to schools and engage the younger generations. We know from many interactions that there is a demand for discussing the implications of AI and technology and how we can protect ourselves and our democracy. People want politics to take action. And we want to ensure that people know this can be done and there really is no need to feel helpless. So I very much echo what you said before. I think this is really the central message, not only um, to tell people about the, the background and the details, all that, but letting people know, you know, this is a discussion you're part of. You, 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 should, you should engage in, you should participate in. And science is working on this, but the more people are willing to engage, the easier it becomes. And in the future, we will try to address these topics also from a more global perspective, specifically the Global South, because we have not talked about the fact 
that many of the issues we discuss are literally first world problems. And if we talk about digital humanism, the Western perspective alone is way too narrow. Okay, so apart from the projects that we do and the points that I mentioned that are important, what can we do? For sure, things like this, um, that is talking about it. I think that's very important, but also living it. And that might be a bit corny, but I think it's about it's also about being generous. Um, a resilient democracy needs resources. It's expensive, is what I want to say with that. Um, it needs redundancy um, in order for everyone to be represented. Um, the same holds for science, by the way, in case anybody's funding science or has any. Um, but it's worth it. Um, so let's treat ourselves to more democracy. Um, if we just sit tight, it really is in danger. Let me end this how I started. And well, if you are following the lecture series on digital humanism, you at the end, I would usually play a piece of music. So I can't do that now, but we would end this with a piece of music. A piece of music would be fitting, um, but I'm just gonna quote two lines from a song by the Austrian artist Gustav, herself quoting another song. And it starts, like I started to talk, dear fellow citizens. The other line is, we shall overcome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Peter, also for that talk and for ending on that optimistic note. I, I, I love that. We shall overcome. Now, my, my, my first question is to the organizers. How much time do we have? So um, we I, I know we're running late. Um, at most 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. So, um, um, yeah, we, we heard two fascinating talks and, um, uh, let, let, let me maybe start with you, Merve. Um, uh, normally when, when, when we have panels with speakers from the U S and from Europe, um, the, the R word regulation is the big controversy, you know, when I, when I listened to you and, um, I hope I'm not mistaken. I, I heard you speaking favorably of, of, of regulation. And I, I, I heard you kind of mention a couple of um, features of what will probably be the, the, the European Artificial Intelligence Act. So um, what is your take on, on, on regulation as a, as a, as a tool of, of, for governing AI and for um, governing digital ecosystems at large? Me now, yeah. all right. Uh, I liked our word <laughs> in this context, uh, and I, I mentioned a couple of the features because it creates the clarity, it creates the regulatory and compliance clarity to the developers, to the providers. This is an evolving, evolving technology. We are literally driving on the road while we are building the road and the road signs and putting the rules together. So if you think of that evolution and what is emerging, not only the developers, but the companies, as well as the policymakers, are trying to figure out at least the boundaries of uh, what we are dealing with and the boundaries of how to foster these technologies, how to use develop these technologies in a way that protects our civil rights, protects our human rights. So citizens, cost, consumers, clients, patients, etc., do not become experiments. It is not a free for all on one side. But I heard again and again from the developers, from companies, small and medium-sized companies as well, saying, we don't know what we can develop or cannot develop. Uh, so in that sense, I think we need the regulations. And I'm also mindful that US and Europe has different legal systems, right? So in one context in Europe, you have to define everything in detail unless it is written in a regulation. You cannot go take someone to court, keep someone liable. In the US context, it is very different. You can have this like high level regulations, legislations, appoints or you know, provides the powers, enforcement and investigative powers to an agency. 
and then the agency figures out how to implement that they do rulemaking etc so you don't have to like line by line define everything even then in the us right now there is a consensus a bipartisan consensus i would say on the need for regulation because us policymakers at large do not want to miss you know repeat the mistake of section 230 of social media uh, and they have seen some of the harms of this emerging technology so for ai even in the us there's a okay let's at least put the guardrails and we stay on the road and then we'll figure the roads and where it leads to where it leads us to but it's shown as like a clarity or like a sign as well Oh, thank you so much. Actually, we are, we are also now, um, uh, to an increasing extent, having these delegated acts so that we only have the main points in the legislation and then delegated acts. Peter, I mean, you're one of those who build the technology. Um, would you agree that uh, regulation is uh, the, the the way forward? When when, when I uh, talk with, with colleagues from the tech world, they often tell me, well, you know, those lawyers, those legislators don't really know what they're doing. They don't understand the technology. They're coming too late. They're not doing the right things. So would you agree? Well, I think even if you don't understand the technology, you might understand the implications of the technology, and that's good enough. Um, I think the regulation is, well, first of all, I'm very much in favor for, of regulation. Um, I think it helps us also in the process of education, I think it's very good to have these standards to tell our students, you know, this is the law, this is what you have to um, adhere to. Um, that that makes sense. So similar as the developers, I think this is good when if there's if there's rules and people know that there's certain agreements that have been made and certain standards that have been set. So even from the university perspective, I would be or I'm strongly in favor of of having that. Currently, there's a lot of, um, you know, like. Um, recommendations on what to do and you can discuss that what would be good and what would be ethical behavior and all of this but this is not a hard fact that you tell to the students but having the having a legal framework behind this i think is is actually helping not that i think our students would, would abuse that anyways but um of course i think it's it, the clarity helps us as well and and what about technology itself? I mean, you you listed this amazing uh, number of projects of people in the room here, all of whom are working on making you know this this technology better and 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 more aligned with digital humanism. Um, what can be achieved by technological means? I mean, like making AI more explainable and so on. Um, how far are we now? And and. Um, yeah, maybe you could enlighten the audience a little bit, even though this is a technical university, probably most of the audience know very well what's feasible, but maybe some don't. Yeah, the explainability part is a is a tricky one, to be honest, because, well, first of all, there are AI systems that are perfectly explainable, and actually all of these systems are perfectly explainable, they're just too complex to be graspable, that's the, that's the issue that we're having. So even if we have, um, so everything can be run on a machine you know it's all deterministic and if there's a random number that is in, included there that's still the explanation for that but that is not an explanation that is useful to anyone so what we need is actually a very simple explanation why a decision has been made now complex decisions decisions seldomly have um easy or ex uh, very understandable explanations so i think this is a bit of the issue that um explainable ai has as well um, we can craft explanations of these models. That doesn't mean they're true. The only question is, can we build these systems so that people feel like there's enough um, already expressed in there and they have a broad understanding of what's going on and is it enough? But when it comes to also what's part of the regulation, right, the liability and like certain standards that you have in terms of transparency and, and explainability in these systems as well, um, that will be very interesting to see where the line is drawn, what is enough in terms of an explanation in order to have done enough um, to, to check the system. I don't think you can ever expect like these systems to not make any mistakes and know perfectly what they're going to do. If that was the case, we wouldn't need them. We would have very simple algorithms instead of complex machine learning systems. 
Well, thank you so much for, for also explaining this. Um, before we open the floor to the audience, maybe one uh, last question to you, uh, Merve. I mean, now on the panel and in this room, we have um, uh, people from, from the US, from, from Europe, but there are other regions in the world. And you mentioned um, from how many nations your students are. Um, I know from uh, where the students at Technical University come from. So they come from all continents, basically. And um, so um, what, what, what is the role actually of, of those other regions in the world? Um, uh, um, it, it's not just US and Europe, right? It's they they have their own views, they are developing their own solutions. So what is your uh, view on this? Uh, every culture needs to create their own roadmap as well mm -hmm. as their regulations and policies that is going to work for their own citizens, for their own businesses. And we see different uh, applicate or different approaches so Japan, for example, or UK do not want to regulate, but are counting more towards voluntary commitments and soft, gu soft guidance, whereas U Europe is looking to regulate or is regulating, US is looking more likely to regulate. But also, it's not only about regulation or policy making, I would say, with the systems, we are also risking a digital divide so take chat Ch GPT or G generative AI systems at large. What we are not discussing is these are very much systems based on very much based on Anglo-Saxon corpus, language corpus, uh, world views, world perspectives. So you either need you need to speak English most of the time to engage with the systems, benefit from the systems if you're going to benefit from it, um, use it in your products in your services or you are going to you know not not being able to integrate in, in interact with them in your native language or you say i'm not going to use it so we're widening that gap of digital divides as, as well of the countries who will benefit it and who will not and we're not we're also not reflecting those diverse responses perspectives, different cultures in this in this systems either. So whatever an, an American or a British or a French company at the moment decides what should be reflected in this in the systems as what is reflected and it just gets amplified. So I think we also need as a global alliance, but as also as national governments, more resources into local systems, local languages. So we kind of break this very Anglo-Saxon, uh, it works for our culture, right? But it is not fit for other cultures and we need to respect that diversity as well. Well, thank you so much for that important point. And, and in fact, it's not just, you know, you need to build local systems and not just having diverse teams in some place in, in Silicon Valley. Um, I, I think mindful of the fact that we are running late and that we only have like 10 minutes left, I would like to open now the floor to the audience. I, I hope there are mics to be carried around. Yes, I see a first question here. Yeah, my name... My name is Flor Michaelis from TU Wien. Thank you very much for this engaging presentations. And I'd like to start off with perhaps a provocative question. So I observed it a lot when you see people with academic backgrounds um, discussing technology, very often the answer is regulations. So um, my question now, um, what is it really what we have to regulate? Is it specific about AI? Or is it more about the capital that's behind the technology? Because we know today there's maybe three, four, five big players that are actually training the big models. It used to be computing power. Now it's the power of having these trained models. So what is what we have to regulate? Is it the technology or is it actually the companies, the corporations that are behind that and are further capitalizing on that advantage they have gained? Uh, so let, let me go first, tackle that one first. Uh, it is, I would say it is not the, the technology, but the use of the technology, how we are using this technology to decide on who gets employed, who gets credit. So if, as a female, do I get a, a employment opportunity? Do I get, if I'm a single, for example, female or recently divorced female, where assets you 
used to be with my husband and I don't have any credit history, do I as a female get credit? Do I get insurance if I have a disability where the AI system is not recognizing? Do I get, I don't know, government benefits or other opportunities, employment or rights opportunities? So it's the way that we are using the use cases that we are regulating, uh, I would say, or we should say. Peter, you also want to comment on that? I think it's also great to regulate those five companies in the world, honestly. So. Okay, <laughs> great. Can I, can I just say yeah, one please. thing? Sure. Can I just ask one thing though? As a citizen, maybe maybe we can discuss like business wise. As a European citizen, do you feel your data, your rights, more protected with with this versus where you might be in another country where it's a free for all for these corporations for any corporation? I think this was a question to you. <laughs> because I I would like to live in 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 Europe where by where as an individual, I'm not trying to fight against like the business models or some of the corporations that I know someone bigger, someone more collectively have my rights uh, in their mind. That's my view. No. Okay, I, I see two questions. There was one in the um, law of, uh, well, yes, <laughs> last row. Thank you. My name is Alexander Klimberg. I'm a recovering executive from the World Economic Forum where I was the head for the Center for Cybersecurity. And I've been working on internet governance and cybersecurity issues for the last 15 years or so. Um, and I'd like to remind everyone that Lawrence Lessing said code is law. So as important as the data layer might be, the logic layer might be even more important. And it might be also one of the reasons why the free internet that we enjoy today has been such a success. It's because we've paid a lot of attention to the open standard setting process that powers it the work that is done by volunteers, Internet Engineering Task Force, the World Wide Web Consortium, and many other bodies. So my question to the audience, and also in particular to the speakers, is what do you think are the lessons learned from 25 years of successful internet growth to be had from the open standard setting process in internet governance for AI governance? What have you learned from how coders have actually made law to us trying to tell coders how to make their products? Thank you. Mm. Who wants to take that question? I need to think of it, but um, I think there's two things, two things that should be separated, right? So the big success on the technical level is one thing, and I think we have there's many things we can learn in terms of interoperability and so on that that um, that we should also follow more in the in the newest developments. But really, what the let's say the business case of the internet has brought about is not so much an interoperability. It's really much more um, like a fractioning of the internet. Um, it's um, like closed systems. It's closed standards. All of this, all on top of that open internet that we had before. So even having all these open standards does not really require anybody to build something on top that is equally open. It just led to a, you know, a business that did not follow these principles um uh, on on top of this so um i think what we can learn is that it makes a lot of sense and it's very successful to have interoperable systems um but it seems like we have to force companies to do that because it's not happening on on its own you want to come in otherwise we have one further question the second drive say Gabriel Sinigo, a diplomatic historian. I have a question as to the strategic advantage on generative AI when it comes to China and US in comparison. Thank you. Can you repeat the question again? I would like to know the strategic competition between US and China when it comes to generative AI. Com there is definitely competition in terms of generative AI systems, uh, but I would say there's competition in, what's the main word? So in China, a lot of the regulations that you see, both the development of the systems as well as the regulation of the systems uh, are more aligned with where, where the state wants to be, right? So state is putting a lot of money in, in, re, in academic researchers as well as private companies 
in terms of these are the systems like object recognition systems, voice recognition systems, text sentiment analysis, etc. These are the systems that we would like it to develop because I have a state use for it as well. So the, the resources, the funding, et cetera, is going towards very specific use cases, both in normal AI, like traditional AI, traditional, uh, but generative AI systems as well. In the US, it is the industry, the markets uh, driving those research opportunities. Yes, there is federal funding, science find, find funding, et cetera, but it's really the market and the corporations that are driving, okay, this is where we're going. It is not the state trying to come up with what kind of technology I need that I can then repurpose for state purposes. For example, China wants object recognition because there is an enormous amount of surveillance, object recognition and you know person recognition surveillance. Same thing with voice, same thing with gait recognition, same thing with sentiment analysis. They want to be able to figure out, monitor, and surveil what is happening on the communication um, channels, what is happening on, on chat, what is happening with their social media, et cetera. So there is always, think, I always think of it as what is going to be, if they're putting so much money into it, where is it going to be repurposed? Whereas US, Europe, and other countries, that is not necessarily the case the malicious users, misusers, et cetera, kind of follows the invention. It's not a perfect world, but I would say uh, the competition is not necessarily for the competition's sake. It is for the purposes. Thank you so much. So before I call on Hannes, um, maybe one last question to you and at least a very brief answer. So why is such a citizen dialogue as we're having today so important in this context? So what makes it so important? Very briefly from each of you. Peter, you'd like to start? Because <laughs> it is a democracy, yeah. right? You, you be, have a voice. And without the citizens, without the citizen engagement, citizen voice, I don't think we can count as a democracy. I have to say that I was surprised that the citizen dialogue is actually us being the citizens and having the dialogue. And usually I would expect all the citizens somehow engaging in the dialogue. But um, I think it's a it's a great opportunity to have this, um, like in this format mm -hmm. um, for that purpose, really of understand, like as a diplomatic thing, but not by diplomats. That's how Thank you so much. I think these are ideal closing words, but <laughs> um, Hannes, um, would you do us a favor and come to the mic and present something you wanted to present to us, to the audience? <laughs> Thank you. Um, you heard a lot about a book which I want to present to you. Thank you for giving us the floor. It's the new textbook on digital humanism, introduction to digital humanism. It's just arrived as a physical copy. You can download it from Springer. Uh, it's uh, for teaching purposes. It was published on December the 22nd, and we already have nearly 100,000 downloads. It's open access, so it's quite a, quite a success. Each of its 40 chapters, Erich will tell us something about what is the content? I just say something about the structure. Each of the chapters can be used for teaching. Each of the chapters finishes with a list of questions to students and teachers and with further literature so you can use it for your teaching purposes. Thanks, Hannes. So very briefly, I'm not going to talk about 40 titles. Um, it, it addresses a lot of different aspects that have been addressed today. It touches upon digital humanism. It touches upon digital writes about work in the digital age. Uh, it is about um, freedom of speech. It is about uh, democracy, obviously, but it's also a bit technical in parts. It discusses issues of privacy, of data protection. So it does also try to give some answers. I think it's a solid basis. Whereas our first book, The Perspectives on Digital Humanism, mostly asks questions, I think. We try to give at least pointers um, for directions where to find the answers. And it's also a good case of collaboration between different disciplines from computer science to philosophy 
to social science, legal studies, etc. Um, and this is why we would like to hand the book over to our guests. To our guest from the U US as a present to you to carry it home or read it already here. So we have copies. Please come on. And we need a photo because we need, need it for PR. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much also to all distinguished speakers. And now, um, on behalf of the president of the um, uh, this university, um, uh, we would like to invite you all um, to for an informal get together. Um, it's just across uh, the hall, and um, I hope that we will have the time to um, kind of deepen, have, have some in-depth discussions also over a glass of wine. So thank you so much, Excellencies. Thank you so much, um, distinguished speakers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, and have a nice evening. <laughs>